thank you very much. Um, so first, let me thank the organizers for putting together this great workshop and uh, for giving me the opportunity to present the results of a project that I've been working on in the past, say, couple of years with my collaborators. So this is a joint work with Andre Hulik, Emmanuel Malek, and Daniel Waldram. One of them is present here. There should be. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, okay, so the, may, the, the title is maybe a little cryptic, so let me, let me start with some idea and motivation part to, to tell you what is the goal. And so the story, let's see, let's, so the story begins in, oh, does it work? It works, okay, sorry. I think it's falling out. So the story begins in, in string theory, where it's been known for a couple of decades that there are some particular aspects of string theory that can be very conveniently described using a class of objects known as current algebraids. So there is various aspects related to string low energy effective actions, sigma models, dualities, and these kind of things. So to motivate it, let's, let's think about uh, the string massless sector, let's say the bosonic string, where we have the, the fields are metric, B field, and, and the dilaton. Uh, so this thing, I will see it as a two form, or more properly it should be seen as a connection on a gerb, but it's not essential for today. So if you write down the effective action that these fields, that, that governs the dynamics of these fields, then you will notice that it has, that it has several gauge symmetries. So there will, there will be a diffeomorphism symmetry, which is infinitesimally parameterized by vector fields, and there is a there is a gauge symmetry for the B field where we can move it by D of a one form, and that corresponds to, so, so infinitesimal symmetries of that theory can be parameterized, can be described conveniently by sections of this bundle. Let me call it E for later. And if you look at the algebra of these symmetries, then it turns out that you can describe them if you use sections of this bundle. Um, just the notation, let's say x. If I have, a, if I have two sections of this thing, x plus alpha and y plus beta, then I can write down the following expression. which is weird in the sense that this is not anti-symmetric, although the algebra of symmetries of the theory is, but for, we are, if we want to describe it in terms of sections of this particular bundle, then the price to pay for that is that the bracket becomes not. Uh, yes, uh, right. Uh, no, no, but it's, it's, uh, it's another way of looking at the fact why this is not anti-symmetric, I think. Right? That's, that should be the same thing. Um, sorry? Yeah, but he, he's saying that like the, 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 yeah, I can have like. Thanks. Yeah, in any case, if I don't think about gauge symmetries for gauge symmetries and just want to capture this and uh, this, this I find like, this is, I should just chose this as a very particular way to motivate this type of structure. So just the, there is this bundle, sections of whose can be used to describe symmetries of the theory and the, the algebra of the symmetries is described by this. Yes, right, uh, yes. That's why I'm not, yes, okay, right. Um, and on top of that you can also, you have some, since, since the fibers of this bundle are kind of special, they have these two bits, then you can also, it's easy to, well, you can define a inner product by simply using the fact that you can pair vectors with covectors. So it's not just any vector bundle, it has an inner product, a, a natural one. Now, okay, uh, now the picture I want to draw is that it's been known since the 90s that this type of structure falls into a larger class of so-called current algebraids. Algebraids. 
And there is a particular sector in here, which, which you can call exact current algebraids. And the, this is the sector that corresponds to things like that. Uh, and in, uh, there is, a, in fact, a little bit more freedom. So a thing in here can look like this, but it can, there, there is a little bit more freedom you can add here a term where you use a tree form. So it's plus H, where H is a closed tree form. Uh, closed. And then it can be shown that, in fact, I mean, I didn't define this object so far, but like, if you define a type of object and you impose some relatively very simple looking condition, then you can recover precisely these types of structures. So, uh, the Maybe a good question is why, why is it useful in terms for like physics, for, for string theory, to look, to look outside of that sector? And for me, the answer comes from dualities. So sometimes it may happen that there are two different exact current algebraids corresponding to two different manifolds M and two different three forms that actually are linked in some very subtle way. And the, in terms of current algebra, that way is very easy to describe. You can just say that there exists a third current algebra somewhere outside of this realm, and these two guys are pullbacks in some natural sense. And uh, this relation is known as Poisson Lee T duality. So do you say that these two things are Poisson Lee T dual? So Poisson Lee T duality is a particular non abelian generalization of T duality introduced by Klimchig and Shevera in the 90s. And in terms of current algebraids, as discovered by Pavel, it just takes this super simple form that, that yeah, that they, you have two things which are pullbacks of the same thing. And sometimes this thing outside is very, very simple. So there is a particular region here of current algebraids which look very different from those. And those things are given simply by Lie algebras with inner product. Lie algebras with invariant pairing. So both this and this sector fall into some larger class of objects, and sometimes it can happen that you have two setups which are pullbacks from here. This is called Poisson Lee duality without spectators. So, okay, so without going into more detail, the, 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 I just wanted to persuade you that it's useful for the study, for the purpose of study of dualities to go outside of this realm of exact current algebra. It's also useful for other things. For instance, you can study heterotic string theory if you go out, but I will focus on this story of dualities. So now the idea is that we want to do the same thing in M theory. So in M theory, there is a particular um, analog of the, that story where this part is known. So there is a, so it's known that if you study M theory or more precisely M theory reduced to, M, uh, to say N dimensions, then the, 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 well, the, 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 the content that you have in M theory is given by metric and there is a three form and usually you dualize and there is some other stuff. So the analogous bundle, instead of having one forms, it has two forms, and then because you also have some higher stuff there, that it continues because you can have gauge transformations of the dual form, and then as you go higher and higher, so M is here the dimension of, uh, of M. And then it goes on, and there is some bizarre things that appear, and it goes on, etc. And there is a particular bracket on this again. Let me not write it because it's complicated, as you might guess. And now instead of, instead of this third bit, instead of having an inner product, this thing has a particular EN structure, or more precisely ENN times R plus structure. So, so, um, so this is, these are the groups that, that we, we, saw on, we saw on Monday. So these are, these are split real forms of the exceptional algebras. And if you go out, if n is not equal to 6, 7, eight, or 8, you just extrapolate them in terms of thinking diagrams. So these are the things that appear. And in particular, it, uh, fibers of this, and notice that this n is this n. So 
fibers of this bundle, they transform in the fundamental representation of this, of this group. This R plus, unfortunately, it has to be present for some reasons in which I don't want to go at the moment. But uh, anyway, the, the point is that the story, there is a parallel of the story, but it's much more complicated in a sense. And uh, in terms of the picture, this kind of corresponds to knowing this, this region in the middle while we don't know the stuff outside. And uh, although it sounds like a boring generalization, we actually want to understand the stuff outside for the reason of understanding dualities. So in this case, there is a notion known as poisson liu duality. And another, phys another physical interesting question will be related to so-called consistent truncations. Consistent, consistent truncations of M theory or type two string theory to lower dimensional maximally supersymmetric supergravities. I would just say consistent truncations. Uh, so in terms, of, in terms of the picture, these things correspond to the fact that again, there will be some mysterious region here, which will be particularly simple, and consistent truncations will just correspond to pullbacks from their wiggly line above. So this is, these are the reasons why we want to understand this kind of story. And so the progress in this direction is that if you look at this bundle and you realize that n is the dimension of m, then if n is low enough, then most of the stuff at the end drops out. And in particular, if n is smaller or equal than six, then you only have these three terms and there is no mixed tensor. So you might guess that it's simpler. And in fact, there is a nice answer to these type of questions, which we did a couple of years ago and we called the objects G-algebroids. So this is a story that's a little bit, that, that's kind of very much parallel to the story of Courant algebraids. And the, the essential change there is that instead of, the idea for G-algebroids is that you, instead of having a inner product on the fibers, which is valued in real numbers, it's valued in another bundle. So uh, there have been also similar constructions in the literature. We were not the first ones to come with it, but we, I think we're the first ones to apply it in this context and prove some structural results and classifications and, and things. So the point is that for n going up to six, the stuff works, can be made to work. And uh, what I want to present today is that now we have an answer for n equals seven. And um, for n larger than seven, there are some conceptual reasons that uh, I might discuss later on for which we believe that in this type of, this particular type of framework, we cannot fit it for n eight and higher because of this dots essentially, because of this, this stuff. So I will focus on n equals seven today. So, and I will try to build this picture. That's the goal. So, and, and, any questions? Uh, I will describe that later on. But if you know the, okay, I, I will describe it later on, but essentially for any current algebra, there is a natural sequence, which is a, there's a natural chain complex and which is given by the anchor and the transpose of the anchor, which are objects that I will define soon. And if this is exact, you call it exact. Um, and there will be, uh, one of the punchlines of the story is that once we define this, that's actually how we know what the right class of objects is, because you can always, you know, you can just always fit it in some larger class of algebras, but the point is that you want to find the one of the right size. And the right size is measured by the statement that in, for instance, for G-algebroids, if you define them, then you can, there is a natural associated sequence. And if you impose exactness of that sequence, then you recover precisely this example. So that's, that's, that's what we are actually looking for. We want to have a class of algebraids which is large enough to include dualities, but not too large, just the right large. Okay, so now let me be a little bit more precise. So let me start with a more general framework in, into which all this is embedded, and that's Leibniz algebraids. So, so Leibniz algebra is a very simple type of structure. Well, at least if you compare it to those ones. 
It's a it's a Leibniz algebraid. Is given by a it's a triple. Uh, where, okay, so let's see, so E is a vector bundle. Rho is a vector bundle map from E to the tangent bundle, covering the identity map. And bracket is a bilinear operation on the it's an R bilinear operation on the fiber on the sections of the bundle. That's precisely what we have over there, for instance, or here. And uh, well, this is subject to some conditions, so such that, and we are only putting the bare minimum. So we want that there is an analog of a Leibniz identity or, or Jacobi identity. Uh, So we want that the bracket acts as a derivation of itself. Right, that's one. So if the bracket would be anti-symmetric, then this would be the Jacobi identity. But the bracket is not required to be anti-symmetric. That's not part of the definition. And the second thing is that apart from B, well, there is another sort of derivation property that we can require, and that's the fact that if I have two sec if I have a section, I can multiply it by a function to get a new section, and we require that this thing again has two forms, so this is again a derivation. And for the first term, I will use the anchor to turn se the section X into a vector field, and then take derivative of F. So this is the end of the definition. So it's a very, very general structure. It's too general to be useful for our purposes, but it's nice to define it and illustrate some basic features. So one, for instance, so this is the end of the definition, then nice, one nice property that you can prove by fiddling with these two axioms is that the bracket actually preserves, sorry, the anchor, which is, this map is called the anchor. So the anchor, is actually a homomorphism on the space of sections. So uh, it intertwines the bracket, the Leibniz bracket, and the commutator of vector fields. Okay, so this is the this is on TM. This is just a funny exercise from these two axioms. Um, remark: uh, If the bracket is actually anti-symmetric, then in addition to those axioms, then we call it the Lie algebra. But as you see here, we want to go in a different direction because this is not anti-symmetric. Uh, okay. So some nice things that you can do with the Leibniz algebra is that you can define, so if you have this operation, then this is something that takes a section and gives you another section. Similarly, this x, it can act on functions as we saw in here, so there is also this thing, so this thing acts on sections of E, this thing acts on functions on the base, and you can just uh, follow the usual differential geometric law and you can extend this to a operation on arbitrary tensors. So you can define a so-called generalized Lie derivative, which acts on tensors T, where T is an arbitrary section of a bunch of E stars and a bunch of E's you simply use the Leibniz rule to extend it. So this is generalized Lie derivative. And so a small definition in here, we say that T, a tensor T is invariant if it's killed by every X. So T is invariant if LXT is zero for all X. Natural definition. Uh, so in ordinary geometry, there is not much tensors that would satisfy this, but not many of them, but in here there will be more of them. This is for the erasing rate. Okay. Uh, no. Okay. 
Any questions? Uh, yes, sort of. Uh, okay, so another thing that you can define, you can define a connection, or more properly a Leibniz connection, I guess. Okay, so, uh, okay. I will just call it a connection. A connection on the Leibniz algebra is a map. It's a usual thing, but you replace TM everywhere by sections of E, and you want the identity that if you, if you well, first of all, you want that in this slot, function, the, the operation is, is linear, function linear, while this thing satisfies an identity similar to that one. Oops. And again, you can you can take this operation and the operation on functions, and you can extend this to a connection on arbitrary t, arbitrary tensor t. And so, one last small definition uh, is that we say that connection is, is T compatible well if <laughs> this thing is zero. Okay, so not, uh, nothing too fancy. Okay, yes? Uh, well, n I would say no because there. I mean, so so, so for general for an arbitrary Leibniz algebra, there is no no good s sequence. You need you need to have more conditions. For instance, for Courant, you would need that there is an inner product and some compatibility. You know, I I think I I erased it, but I don't think there is a natural sequence. This is this is this structure is too general. It doesn't have any. Uh, yes, but like this thing is just very, very bare and doesn't have any interesting geometry in itself, I would say. And there is no, there is no natural candidate for an exact sequence for that one. Sorry? Uh, I don't think so because there is a, uh, so one, so this, so the structure is so general that if you, if you look at the, axi the axioms, and there is actually no prescription of how, it, how the things behave if you put a function in the first slot, which is, a, so it's not even clear if it's a differential operator or. Y yes, yes, so you would need more. So yeah, but I, I only define it because I, I don't know, I want it as like just some simple playground to define in general. The generalized derivative and connections and and this and for that it's only enough to have that those axioms but i will do well now i will add more stuff so now i mean this was a little bit boring so let me do some interesting more interesting things so let me start with the lie algebra sorry lie with algebraic part so uh so in 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 current algebraids and in this G algebraids and whatever, the, a, a prominent role is played by the inner product. Uh, and kind of the, the message today is that we make a sort of radical change and we throw it away completely. So uh, now let me talk about the class of objects for whom the name in progress is Y algebraids. And uh, so let me start with some linear algebraic part. So, so suppose that we have a vector space, which I will call R for some secret reasons. So vector space. And instead of studying inner product or some generalization, which is valued in another vector space, I want this to be equipped with a particular tensor. So some, I want this to exist a 
Okay, sorry, this Y is not to be confused with that Y. <laughs> uh, I want to have a map which goes from endomorphisms on, uh, of R to endomorphisms of R. So in the index structure, if you like to think about that, it looks like this. Two upper and two lower indices. Yes, yes, that's, 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 that's it. Um, okay, so what can you do with such a thing? So, well, you can define automorphisms of this, y, well, of, of, of such a setup. So this is by definition all, let's say, A, or invertible automorphisms of, of the vector space which preserve this tensor Y. And another thing you can define, which is slightly less obvious, make definition. So you say that a subspace V is called co-isotropic with respect to the data. If, and okay, now let me let me give you the index definition because that's the, that's by far the, cl the clearest one in here. So if for all size in the annihilator of that, okay, so the annihilator is the space of all forms on R, one form such that uh, they are ki they are killing the entire V. So it's a subspace of the dual. So for all size, we want that. This is zero. You can write it in an index-free notation, but it's not as enlightening as <laughs> this one, unfortunately. So, okay, so this is uh, a rather random thing. So the point of calling it coisotropic is that in one of the in one of the main examples where where this R and Y come from an inner product, it will correspond to coisotropy in the usual sense for for a vector space with an inner product. Okay. Okay, now I can define the Y algebra. Right? Any questions? Okay. Um, so a Y algebra. Right? So funny thing about this Y algebra is that it's sort of simpler than the G algebra from before, although it's more general. Um, but then you will see. A Y algebra, say E or whatever. A Y algebra is a Leibniz algebra with one extra structure. And that is an invariant. tensor Y, I will call it capital Y, of the same type, so it's a bundle map from this to this, so it's, it's Leibniz algebra, it's E, uh, such that there exists a Y compatible connection for which X, X equals Y, nabla X, X. So, so it's a Leibniz algebra with, with one extra piece of data, a tensor, and some conditions on that tensor. First of all, it's invariant, and second of all, there is a connection such that the symmetric part of the bracket can be written like this. So this, this, this thing constrains the object quite heavily because in particular it tells you what happens if you put function in the first slot. Uh, you know how to, how to rotate it to put it in the second slot and then you know how to take it out using Leibniz algebra axioms. It's the same, this it's, 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 it's is the symmetric part of the bracket. So uh, alternatively I could say, uh,
but uh, for simplicity, I, I, I find this one prettier. So, uh, so the meaning here is that you, you know you take x is a section for any section of E. So, well, the left hand side is a section of E again. So this thing here is a, uh, I mean, there's a free slot for the connection. So this, the, the result of this, of, of this guy is a section of E star tensor E, which is precisely what this Y needs to eat. And then it produces another endomorphism, and then you act with that endomorphism on X again. Okay, so it's our definition, which is rather sort of different from definitions you normally see for Courant algebraids, Lie algebraids, or you know, these kind of things. Um, yes. Um, I, I um, so already, well, I, I don't have a good, I would like to have an interpretation of that in terms of the right bracket, but I, I'm not sure it exists in some simple way. Okay, so that I should may, may, may mention that there has been similar objects defined in the literature, so there is something called anti-commutable uh, Leibniz algebraids, which is almost this definition, but there is no invariance properties. Um, this is recent work by Derelli and the one. Okay, but, okay. Okay, so maybe one final piece of definition here. So if we start from that linear algebraic Thing story where we have a fixed vector space and a y tensor, lowercase y, then we say that a y algebroid is of class Ry if every fiber looks like this. So if for every point m on m, the fiber, there exists a map phi m from the fiber to this given space R such that uh, phi is pushed forward to, sorry, y is pushed forward to the other one. So essentially the, the we say that an algebra is of this class if at every point it is isomorphic to this linear algebraic datum. And those are the ones that we will be interested in. And in particular, uh, note that this is not, such an identification is not unique because if you have, if you have one such identification, then you can post compose, the, post -compose it with a, with a transformation of R which preserves Y, which is this out of Y. So in fact, every Y algebra of class RY, it automatically brings into game a principal bundle for the group out Y. Is a remark. Sorry? You mean this? Uh, well, um, so in general, okay. So the the, I, the cases I will be interested in do come from exceptional geometry, and and there, I mean. Okay, so if, if it's just existence, then you can always, you can always take a Leibniz, uh, you can take the anchor to be zero, and then you can do almost whatever you want. So that's, I mean, there definitely exists numerous examples, but they are maybe not that interesting. So interesting examples will come in a moment, if I, if I put further restrictions on this guy. Um, so let's, let me formulate it as a small proposition. Oh, sorry, such that, such that big Y is carried to small Y. So if I take, let's say, if I push forward the big Y, I get the small Y. So this is supposed to be, sorry, this is an isomorphism. Um, right, okay, so now, now it's a, uh, 
Now, well, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting proposition that follows just from these axioms that the kernel of the anchor map is quasi-isotropic. In that sense, that's fact number one. Well, okay. And th this fact, in equivalently, you can say that there exists, okay, equivalently, we have a particular chain complex um, which looks as follows. So there is T star, there is two E's, there is E, there is TM, and there is zero. So it's a four term complex where this thing is the anchor map and the map in here, if I take Xi, X, and Y, and this is mapped to Rho star of Xi, uh, okay, so I recall that the anchor map was something that went from Tm to E, and uh, the dual will go in the other direction, so from E star to, to T star, sorry, uh, uh, from E to Tm, and the dual will go from the dual space to E star. That's why the following makes sense. And uh, same but with the role exchanged. So the claim is that this is a, is a chain complex. That's very simple to prove if you just take the, if you just apply a row to this left hand side. Um, okay, so now we can make a definition. We can say that a Y algebroid is called exact. If this is an exact sequence, let's call it star. So exact means, in this case, it's just exactness in here and in here, not in here, because there is no map from the left. Okay. Okay. Okay, so if you know about current algebra, then this is sort of deviating from that quite a lot. Let me make one last remark before giving you the examples. So, how does one create these pairs of R and Y of this vector space and the Y tensor? So the typical source of examples is that you start with a, uh, so suppose that R is a represent, that's why I call it R. R is a representation, a faithful representation of a group G and pi um, which is a map of the same type from R star R to R star tensor R uh, is G equivariant and image of that map lies inside the Lie algebra, which is naturally sitting inside R star tensor R. So starting from this group or Lie algebraic data, you can define, you can then define Y to be one minus pi. So this is how you come with a pair. So this is what is usually done in physics, in exceptional geometry, generalized geometry on these, these things. So if you start with a group representation, you can cook up such a pair. Okay, now I can finally go into examples. So, well, 
where we can see how it relates to previously known objects like Lie algebraids, Courant algebraids, exceptional algebraids, and all other kinds of broids. Super jump? Well, sure. Just say everything is a super manifold and. Uh, oh, you mean like current algebra? Yeah, like ah, yeah, no, that is a very good question. Uh, not that I know of, but that, that would be the. So I suspect that uh, in some way this should be possible, but that is by no means clear how to do it, and maybe one needs to go quite far from the usual places to look for. But yeah, I, I, it, I suspect there should be an interpretation, but I don't have it. I don't know. But that was actually the driving impulse at the beginning to find this. So, okay. So examples. So the simplest example that you can think of, starting from these groups, is if you take your group to be GLN, acting on the vector representation Rn. And you can take uh, this projection pi, or this map pi, to be the identity. So the identity is clearly GLN equivariant, and the image of identity is the entire R star tensor R, which definitely lies inside GLN R. So this is fine. So if you take one minus this, you get y is zero. So the pair that you are getting is R, N, and zero. And if you now require, if you are now look at Lie algebra, sorry, Y algebraids of this class, then what happens, because the Y tensor is zero, this right hand side vanishes and you want that the bracket is actually anti-symmetric. And, uh, and the condition of invariance Sorry, well, yeah, it's zero, so it, that's trivial. So, so, the, so this thing reproduces the definition of a Lie algebra. Right? At least of rank n, if you, uh, if you start with fixed GLN. So this is how you recover Lie algebra right? from this story. Now, slightly more interesting setup, actually quite a lot more interesting, is if you take the group the orthogonal group and its vector representation. And you take and you take pi to be the anti-symmetrization map. So this is transposed with respect to the inner product. Okay, so this thing will, will be anti-symmetric, so it will lie in the Lie algebra. And the corresponding y will be simply given by transposing the, the thing. So in other words, if you want to write it in a nicer way, so if you call the inner product eta, then this y tensor simply becomes eta tensor eta star. Or eta, sorry, eta inverse eta. So there will be two indices up and two indices down, because y tensor has alpha, beta, gamma, delta and it's simply given by this expression. And so a nice question is you can ask what are the automorphisms that preserve this, this tensor? So what are the maps of, what are the maps of the invertible linear endomorphisms of this space that preserve such a thing? And because it's a product of two, it's a tensor product of two things, the answer is that uh, these are precisely the transformations that preserve eta up to scale. The scale cancels because there is eta and eta minus one. So this thing actually turns out to be uh, there is two possibilities. <laughs> In general, if you have OPQ, then this group that you are getting is OPQ times times R plus. If they are distinct, if they are the same, then you are getting an extra Z2. This is a, quite a fascinating thing that there is an extra thing. Uh, this is, well, if they coincide. Sorry? Uh, 
Oh, there is a natural. Ah, perfect, okay. Thanks. Okay, then it's not so mysterious. <laughs> um, very good. Okay, so this is this just recovers, oh yeah, and the, the corresponding class of structures that you are getting because of the presence of this extra R plus is not exactly current algebra, but it's something more general. And there is some related notions in the literature known as there is something called E current algebraids or conformal current algebraids or V twisted current algebraids. So there is some related notions in the literature. But it, essentially, this is a generalization of current algebra which allows some scaling. Now what is really, what is the most interesting bit is what happens if you go to exceptional geometry, which is the thing I promised at the beginning. Um, so the most interesting case for us is if you take the group G to be the exceptional group times this not so terribly important extra R. So in terms of thinking diagrams, you would get something like this. And let's say there is a bunch of things, a bunch of nodes depending on the rank. And uh, we take the representation R is always the fundamental representation corresponding to the leftmost node here. And as I said at the beginning, we restrict our attention to at most seven, because beyond that, th things break down for some reason. Um, okay, so, so now, okay, the interesting observation is that if, if n is actually not seven, so this is the more well-known case, if it goes up to six, then it turns out the, the crucial point that, that makes it similar to current algebra is the fact that for these things, if you define the y tensor, so as I, as I discussed before, this data gives you some particular y tensor. And that y tensor, if n is up to, goes up to six, then it turns out that it's actually anti symmetric sorry, it's symmetric, both up and down. So if you symmetrize it up uh, or down, it gives you the same thing. And because of this property, you can, you can actually see that this axiom and this, this weird thing simplifies. So the symmetric part of the bracket, which was this, if you write it down properly, then it will become, you can rewrite it in terms of uh, object like this. Okay, let's make, uh, the, we're here, now I'm contracting y on two upper in two lower indices, so that this makes sense. Anyway, the, the expression is not that important. What is important is that these things group together and you can call this the inner product. And then there is some other operation which we call D in some previous work. And this, this is how you get back to G algebraids. So this is how you recover the previously known story of G algebraids. Okay, now, now the interesting thing happens in N equals seven. Um, oops, where that is no longer true. Okay, so let's part number five. Okay, so in the n equals seven case, Sorry. So in the n equals seven case, the that that thing is just not true, and uh, and the story is more complicated naturally. And then, okay, let's see how. We want. Okay, okay. So the. Okay, let me make one more definition. So we know we know what it means to be uh, y algebraic of class this for for the data for that data for n equals seven. So we have a well-defined notion of 
Y algebroid with E77 and the fundamental representation. So let me just, for short, let me call it E7 algebroid. Okay, so this is just Y algebroid of class that for E equals seven, N equals seven. Okay, so now we say that an E7 algebroid is called M exact. Uh, if it is exact, and the dimension of the base is seven. Okay, this M is not to be confused with this M. This M stands for M theory, this M stands for manifold. So, um, so the reason, so if you, if, you, if, you, if you know a little bit about the current algebraids, then you know that if you specify that the, that the current algebraid is exact, then this tells you in particular that the rank of the bundle is related to the rank to the dimension of the base. Unfortunately, for these more complicated setups, it's not, there, there, there is some branching. So you can have either exact E7 algebraids where the base is seven dimensional or six dimensional. The six dimensional case would correspond to type two B string theory. This corresponds to M theory. And this thing is simpler, so I will stick to that for today. Uh, so it's just, so the moral of the story is that there is two, two different types of exactness. There is, it can be depending on the dimension of the base. And I will focus on this one. And uh, okay, and then you can prove the theorem that, that, that finally confirms that this is the right class of structures to study. So every M exact E7 algebroid is locally of the form that we saw at the beginning. Of the form that as a bundle, it looks as Tm plus wedge two, T star M plus wedge five T star M, and then this weird non-form bit. And the bracket takes that complicated form that I didn't even write before. And uh, what else do we need? We need the white tensor and okay, that comes with the representation theory. Okay, so, so essentially we, we recover the class of objects that, at the that we wanted to recover at the beginning simply by imposing that there is some, con some chain complex which is exact and the dimension of the base is seven. So that, that kind of, tell that, that corresponds to building up this large bubble inside which we have objects of this type. So this large bubble is, are these E7 algebraids. And um, uh, it's not particularly easy to prove this theorem. Um, so the reason, so the, okay, how, how does one prove such a theorem? So what you essentially do is that, um, first you show that if you start with any E7 algebroid E, which is M exact, then you can show that as a bundle at least, as a bundle with a Y tensor, it has this form. That's simple, that's not difficult to prove that as, as a bundle equipped with a, this Y tensor, you, you get an equality like this. Then, so that, that basically tells you that you can move, you can just sit on the right hand side and look for possible brackets on this guy. And when you do that, you will, it will turn out that the brackets always have to take this form plus some tensorial bit. So it, you know, it, it suffices to look at the tensorial bit and for that you use the axioms and there is a horrible calculational procedure for which, which is sort of impossible to do by hand. And, but with the help of Mathematica, if you, if you do it, you will find out that the most general object that you can have in here looks like this bracket but just as for current algebra, we could twist it with a three form. In this case, we can twist it with a one form, a four form, and a seven form, satisfying some Bianchi identities. So uh, this one, the important thing is that this is local analysis. Uh, well, this thing, sorry. Well, this thing is not there uh, anyway because the dimension of the manifold is seven. So there is no Bianchi for this guy. 
Um, so to finish the proof that actually, to finish the proof of the statement, what you have to finally use is that there was a freedom in, in, in deriving this expression, and you can use that freedom to eliminate these things completely by gauge transformations. So locally, you can just, you have just the bracket which is untwisted. But as a nice aside, the proof of this thing tells you what are the possible twists. And uh, yeah, and then you can go and study the global structure, but it's kind of too complicated, so uh, let me not talk about that one. Yes, yes, so, yes, exactly. So, so, um, so exactness and this fact, secretly what they tell you is that in every fiber, um, the, in every fiber the, the kernel of the anchor has to be, what is it, uh, is co-isotropic of a particular form. So then it looks, then, then it suffices to look at all co-isotropic subspaces of that representation R, which is a nasty thing, but you can look at it and you will see that there is some classification of those and essentially they are unique up to the action of the exceptional group. And then you can use, the, so yeah, it's, it's the representation theory of the group. And uh, the fact that it looks like this is just a decomposition under some GLN subgroup. So yeah, th th this part is not difficult, not that difficult. Okay, and uh, maybe to finish, or are there any questions? Yes? Uh, sorry, say it again. Um, right, so, so for, for instance, you can wonder what is the connection in here? Okay, yeah, that's, that's a good thing that I should have said. So, um, <laughs> give more space. So, okay, so in fact, I can give you the explicit form of this bracket. So there is a nice physical way, the way physicists write it down. So suppose that you have this bundle, and suppose that you pick coordinates. On, on the base space M. If you pick coordinates, then that gives you a frame uh, given by partial derivatives of this guy, and also a frame of, uh, since all, all of them are, are tensors, you get a parallelization of the entire thing. So this gives you a parallelization. It tells you that locally, this is a local coordinate chart. Locally, this is M times some vector space, which is essentially this R. This is some vector space. And so, so you can you can look so you can you can instead of talking about sections, you can talk about functions on M, which are just valued in this vector space. And then, and then physicists have this way of writing what the bracket is that it's actually given by. Well, they usually don't use this notation, but I find this one more comprehensive. So you take. So now each of them is a function, and it has some vector space bit. So. You can use the anchor to turn this into vector field and then take derivative of this functional part. And then there is a similar thing for the other way. And then I think it's plus, probably. Uh, yes. I think it's like this. So this is the expression that. Uh, that can be uniformly used to describe the untwisted brackets for Courant algebroids, Lie algebroids, and these exceptional algebroids that people use in exceptional geometry. So here, again, same as here, I'm applying the differential on this bit, so I get a one form, and then I apply row star to go to E star. So I am in E star, tensor E, because of this bit, and I can again apply Y and, uh, and everything. And so, so, when written like this, it's easy to see that that if you take the, the particular connection, which is simply this one, so connection related to that trivialization, then that's a, then that that is a connection. Where is it? Yeah, 
that is a good connection that satisfies this property. So the, an important bit here is that, he, here is that this, there, there is multiple connections like this. They are, connection is not part of the definition, it's a property here. Um, and so typically there is lots of them and there is no, there is no preferred one. And in here, in this example, it, this would depend on the coordinate chart. The, uh, that is a good question. Um, so, let me think, so, uh, I, th I think, well, uh, um, I think, I think in this case there should be a global one. You should be able to glue them together, but I don't remember the details. But it, it, it's a good question. Um, I don't remember the, but anyway, sorry, I should, I should probably finish. Should I? Or, or um, um, okay, l l let me think and l l let's, let's discuss this afterwards. Um, so, Maybe just to, to wrap it up with a few sentences. So the so one application here. So okay. So so far I didn't give you a physical application. This is just a statement about the structure of these of these things, and that you can recover them. Impo you can recover these physical interesting examples by imposing some nice and simple condition of exactness. Um, what is also interesting for physicists is, is, to, is to see how this applies to so-called consistent truncations. And for that, let me just give you a theorem, which says that consistent truncations of M theory to lower dimensions, uh, maximally supersymmetric consistent truncations. Okay, this is a sort of half theorem because I'm not defining either side of the correspondence, but anyway. So th th these are in one-to-one -one correspondence with something that can be called exceptional money in pair. Exceptional money in pairs. So if you know what money in pairs are, then there is a natural extension of those in this exceptional setup. And you can use all this whole framework to provide a very simple and clear proof of this correspondence. So if you're interested in what are the maximally supersymmetric gauge supergravities in lower dimensions that come from M theory, or type two string theory, then it suffices to look at like, some particular class of algebraic objects and classify them if you want. So um, this is a particularly nice application of that story. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to discuss this later on and give you some examples of these constant truncations if you want. The most, the most uh, striking one is the one on a seven sphere. So yeah, if you, want to learn more about that, you can ask me later. Yeah, I would, yeah, let's end here, thanks. Yes. So, so these exceptional Manning pairs here, what they are is that they, this is a pair of two objects, A and B, let's say, and this thing here is a um, E7 algebraid over a point, point base. So if you know what ordinary Manning pairs are, then they are pairs where the larger thing is a Lie algebra with an invariant pairing, which is just a current algebra over a point. So in this case, you get an E7 algebra over a point. And this other thing, this is a uh, co-isotropic subalgebra. There is some mild conditions on these, uh, but not very important ones. So essentially, it's a one needs to have an algebra over a point, so just some purely algebraic object, and a subalgebra of that. And for the case of the seven sphere, you can take the A 
to be SO8 plus 28. So you take SO8, which is 28 dimensional, you add the adjoint to it, and then you define a bracket on these things by, um, let's say, X plus U, Y plus V, to be simply, on the first factor, it's just the adjoint of SO8. And then it's just X acting on V. So it's not anti-symmetric, so it's not a Lie algebra, it's, a Leibniz, it's just a Leibniz algebra. And you can, it's not difficult to see that it actually satisfies that definition, so it's an E7 algebraid over a point. And, uh, and B, in this case, is just SO7 plus 28. And you can show that it fits in the definition of coisotropy in there. And if you take their quotients, well, you cannot take the quotient because they, well, they are not Lie algebras, but if you can form Lie algebras out of them and you can take their quotients of the corresponding groups, and that's how you recover the space in here. And in that this case, it would be the seventh sphere. Um, so, so, if, so once it's clear how to do this correspondence, then it just suffices to produce examples on the right, and then you can just turn the handle and you get exactly the seventh sphere. And essentially, the, par the, the exceptional, par the, sorry, this, this maximally supersymmetric condition truncations, it, it corresponds to a particular trivialization, global trivialization of of this bundle over the seventh sphere. And, uh, well. Yeah. Thank you.